This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here and welcome back to our dental anatomy series. In this video, I'll be talking about the maxillary lateral incisor. So this is the permanent maxillary lateral incisor and it's what we'll be talking about all throughout the video. Using the universal tooth numbering system, this would include tooth number seven and number 10. So let's take a look at the facial aspect first. Just like the maxillary central incisor, the tooth is wider up here by the proximal contact area and narrower at the neck. And so it's described as having a trapezoid shape from the facial view, but it's just a smaller trapezoid because it's smaller than what we saw in the last video with the central incisor. A few more things are similar between maxillary laterals and centrals. One is the incisocervical dimension is greater than the mesiodistal dimension. The distoincisal corner is also more rounded, and that whole distal side of the tooth is once again just generally more curved. The root also tends to point towards the distal direction. It also tends to be a little bit more pronounced than it was in the central incisor in terms of its distal pointing direction. The cervical line is once again convex toward the root apex on both the facial and lingual aspects. The mesial height of contour is more incisal on the crown than the distal height of contour, as seen by those arrows here and here. But this time, the mesial height of contour is at the junction of the incisal and middle thirds of the crown. And the distal height of contour is in the middle third of the crown, which makes sense because like I told you in the last video, those height of contours and proximal contacts creep closer to the gum line as we go posteriorly around the arch. Also, it's the most narrow tooth mesiodistally in the entire maxillary arch. A big difference between this tooth and the central is that the maxillary lateral incisor has a very convex crown and root due to a very developed middle facial lobe. Spoiler alert, this facial convexity as shown by these red lines here makes the tooth's mid-root cross-section oval instead of triangular like the maxillary central, but I'll show that to you later in the video. This crown does have the same two developmental depressions shown in this teal color that the central had because it also develops from three facial lobes and then one lingual lobe. From the lingual aspect, we can notice a few important things. One is that this tooth has the most prominent marginal ridges of all the anterior teeth. It also has the most distinct and deepest lingual fossa area of all the anterior teeth. Some maxillary laterals actually have a pit, shown at this black dot, where the marginal ridges meet at the cingulum. And I'll share more details on that later in the video when we talk about common anomalies of these lateral incisors. Next, let's take a look at the mesial aspect. There are some more similarities from this tooth to the maxillary central. Number one, the crown has a triangular side view. Number two, the facial and lingual height of contours once again fall in the cervical third. And this is true for all anterior teeth, all incisors and canines in the mouth. The cervical line is concave toward the apex. That's true for both the mesial and distal sides. And four things once again fall on the long axis of the tooth from this view those being the incisal edge, the proximal contact, the height of the CEJ, and the root apex, all falling on that imaginary long axis line. 
Remember that from the distal surface, the cervical line appears much flatter. It's about one millimeter less curved on the distal surface for a tooth than on the mesial surface. And the proximal contact is more cervically placed on the distal surface compared to the mesial surface. Also note that that proximal contact area is centered on the crown both incisocervically and facial-lingually. It's actually the most cervical proximal contact of any incisor. Again, because of how curved that distal surface is. The crown measurements from the incisal aspect are nearly identical for the mesiodistal and facio-lingual dimensions, so we're just going to call them equal for the sake of this video. The facial surface dominates this view, and that's once again thanks to how convex the crown of the tooth is. All right, I wanna focus on this slide in particular because another important feature of the maxillary lateral is that it's the most likely tooth to be malformed. All of the anomalies on this list are most commonly found in the maxillary lateral, which makes it nice and easy to remember. First up is the peg lateral. This is a microdont, that means an undersized tooth, specifically affecting the maxillary lateral incisor. These small malformed laterals happen in about 2% of patients. So relatively speaking, they're fairly common as far as tooth malformations are concerned. The lingual pit I mentioned before, that's where the mesial marginal ridge and distal marginal ridge extend a bit too far and meet at that cingulum, creating a finite pit. The risk for staining and caries in these pits is very high, so sometimes sealants are placed there proactively to prevent that from happening. The palato-gingival groove or palato-radicular groove is an aberrant groove that extends from the lingual fossa down the root. It's very hard to clean and provides a highway for bacteria to get from the oral cavity down the root. So you can imagine it can cause some periodontal problems, deep pockets, that sort of thing. A hawkbill is where you have an incisal surface tipping toward the lingual, so much so that the incisal edge falls lingual to the long axis of the tooth. And with hawkbill laterals like this, they tend to look more like a mandibular incisor than a maxillary incisor. And we'll talk more about mandibular incisors in the next videos of this series. A talon cusp is a version of dens evaginatus on an anterior tooth, where there's an extra cusp on the lingual surface where the cingulum is. And lastly, dens in dente, also called dens invaginatus, is where there is caved in enamel. And you need a radiograph to diagnose this. It looks like a tooth within a tooth, hence the name dens in dente. It's significant because caries can progress very quickly through the tunnel that comes with this defect. As far as the pulp is concerned, just like the maxillary central, it usually has three pulp horns, except when there is a peg lateral, in which case there's only going to be one pulp horn. And once again, there's almost always just one pulp canal. If we cut the tooth into cross section at the middle of the root, we see an oval, not a triangle. And that's because of how convex that facial surface is. To summarize this tooth, the incisocervical dimension is greater than the mesiodistal dimension, which is equal to the facial lingual dimension. It's the most narrow maxillary tooth, the most likely malformed tooth. It looks trapezoidal from the facial view, triangular from the side view, oval from the root cross section, and usually is made up of four lobes, three pulp horns, and one canal. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. 
you can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.